So we'll allow folks to come on in. It'll be a cute little awkward moment of people staring at faces on a screen because even if we've been on Zoom for two years, it's like every time people are using technology, it seems like we're doing it for the first time. Does it, yeah. Can they hear me now? No. Yeah, they can hear you. Everyone's coming on in. Hey folks, we'll be starting in just a moment. We're giving a little bit for people to enter into the event and then we'll get started. I will be using the chat to give you links to buying the book and other fun stuff like that. Okay, let's do it. Good evening, and it might be quite late wherever you're tuning in from, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight Bookstore, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Maddie Mortimer, presenting her new book, Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies. She'll be reading from and discussing her book, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I want to say a huge thanks to you, Maddie, and the team at Scribner for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection especially across the world. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat, it's a great way to show your appreciation for our author and to interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question that you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be que pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person if you are in the States, in New York, from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Maddie's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. The buy link will be in the chat. And as thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code, all caps, one word, Greenlight Events 10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. And now, our featured author today is Maddie Mortimer. Maddie was born in 1996. She received her BA in English Literature from the University of Bristol. She lives in London, where she works as a screenwriter and an author. Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies is her first novel. Congratulations and happy pod day in the States. Maddie's new book, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies is her breathtaking lyrical debut novel, both a poignant coming of age story and a profoundly moving meditation on illness and mortality this novel unfolds as a kaleidoscopic journey through one woman's life, narrated in part by the voice of her disease. Traveling through time and space, this novel renders a deeply compassionate and startlingly human exploration of desire, loss, and self-discovery in a symphony of layered voices. Maddie is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then we will be discussing the writing process and talking with all of you. So without further ado, please take it away, Maddie. Hello, <laughs> I'm going to be reading from the beginning of the book, which is um, a, often a good place to start. Uh, it will, this reading will give you a sense of um, this inside voice, uh, part of the novel takes place within the landscape of my protagonist's body and uh, the, the beginning of the book begins within her. 
I, itch of ink, think of thing, plucked open at her start. No bigger than a capillary, no wiser than a cantaloupe, and quite optimistic about what my life would come to look like. I have since ached along her edges, delighting in my bare feet floorboard creeps across from where she once would feed down to where her body bruise I have sampled, splintered, leaked and chewed through tissue, nook, bone, crease and node so much, so well, so tough now that the place feels like my own. It is perhaps inevitable that after all this time I have come to feel a little dissatisfied with the fact of my existence. This is not easy to admit. I suppose one can only be a disaster tourist for so long before the cruel old ennui starts to set in. But the Greeks said that in the beginning there was boredom. The gods moulded mankind from its black, lifeless crust, and this is, of course, encouraging. Today, I might trace the rungs of her larynx, or tap at her trachea like the bones of a xylophone, or cook up or undo some great horrors of my own. Because here is the thing about bodies. They are impossibly easy to prowl without anyone suspecting a thing. Until, of course, they do, and then, of course, they aren't. The beginning of the end. Leah remembered two things about the beginning of the end. The first, the time it took the traffic lights to change. The second, the fact that nobody died. She was one crossing away from the place she needed to be, the surging rhythm of the city in her pulse, the day tripping quick towards rush hour. Her senses felt unusually alert, nicked wide open by nerves perhaps. It was nice, a nice change, to feel this exposed, this alive while standing at a red light, waiting for the world to resume itself. A man in a suit that was too small for him sighed heavily and hailed a taxi. Two women spoke loudly on their phones, slices of their conversation burying themselves into the back of her neck. I told him, I said, you can't help how you feel. Booked the 2.30 slot tomorrow. With some leftover casserole in the fridge you can microwave. No cash, I'm afraid. Won't be late. God, I always feel so bad. Remember to feed the cat. Leah pinched the velvet of her earlobe and thought about tragedy. Which poet was it that said an abiding sense of tragedy can sustain a man through temporary periods of joy? Which philosopher was it that said all tragedies begin with an admirable quiet? Today had been full of clamour. Everyone seemed seconds away from catastrophe. The belt of a woman's coat bounced against her bicycle spokes. Cycling accidents were rising at a steady rate of 15% each year, more than 4,500 resulting in death or serious injury, yesterday's newspaper had read. The city just keeps culling. There is grief on every street, Leah thought, as the plump belly of a toddler emerged at an open window and her eyes flicked down the floors below, counting, jaw tight, as the toddler leant its milk-white head out in delight, resting its tiny fingers on the ledge. Four floors. The fool was four floors down. Fluorine is a pale yellow, chlorine is a yellow green and bromine is a red brown. A girl in a blue school uniform began lecturing her friend loudly on the subject of elements. The halogens get darker as you go down, see? Leah noticed the girl had thick, straight lashes that interlaced as she blinked and a profile of rare, youthful prettiness, the kind that stood out amongst the mass of waiting faces, growing impatient at the crossing. And it was always so hard, she thought, so hard not to get distracted by beautiful things. Back at the window, the toddler had disappeared. The window had been shut. This was, of course, a relief. She took a deep, heavy breath in through her nose, concentrating on the stretch of her ribs, the widening of her chest, and held it, trapped it there, the crackling warmth of petrol air. It had been two years since she'd walked these streets across this crossing. Two years since she'd sat, staring at the scan of her body and brain, pinned up against the light, pointing to the dark patch, swimming about the centre. That's the corpus callosum, the doctor had said, nothing to worry about. She let the long, lovely breath rush through her lips. Just the thick nerve tract connecting one hemisphere to the other. A gap in the traffic had emerged, a clear path connecting one side of the road to the other. The lights still hadn't changed. 
A man with matte skin made a break for it, which prompted the girl in the blue school uniform to dart out into the road too, pulling her friend behind her. It was then that Leah's eyes latched to the car, turning the corner, coming quickly through the afternoon. She saw the collision before it happened, felt the possibility of it, possibility of it collapse in on her lungs, the way rain crescendos into something more than rain. A throat screech break, delayed smack of machine impact, the buckle of skinny knees as the girl's body hit the concrete. Leah felt time fold, the seconds doubling over. Oh my God, a telephone voice rasped loudly by her ear. But before she could get a closer look, the scene had flooded with people, all gnawing, clawing away at the prospect of a massacre, quick as starving rats to sudden crumbs. Leah wanted to be sick. The girl was dead. She knew it. She could feel it. The new chill in the air, the slowing of the clouds, the dizzying shift of atmosphere when tragedy drops into an ordinary day like this. The crowd seemed to be multiplying and all Leah could think was she would never get to tell her parents about the sort of day she'd just had. She would never take a chemistry exam or fall in love or know what a particularly nasty UTI feels like. She would never go to Manchester to study medicine, never become a medic and get to save any lives. And perhaps there would be other people that would die in years to come because of this very moment, because a man with matte skin had made a break for it and a young girl in a blue school uniform who knew things about elements, had darted out into a road too soon, and Leah had watched all the glittering possibilities of her life flare up and flicker out, just like that. She imagined the horror of walking over, leaning down with the rest of the rats, pu pushing the girl's hair gently off her face, to find that it was Iris, her Iris, her eyes stripped clean of their life. A perfectly functioning body, the doctor had said, and a happy, healthy brain, as if there really was such a thing. The crowd had parted a little so that Leah could finally get a glimpse of the girl, lifting to her feet, just as Iris would at three or four after having taken a tumble. I'm fine, she was saying as she brushed herself down quite unharmed. Someone offered to examine her knees. I'm fine, she said again, only louder and harder her face flushed pink from the shock. Leah couldn't believe it. It was, of course, a relief, but also the slightest bit disappointing. The girl's friend led her back to the safety of the pavement, where they both began to laugh quite hysterically, the terrible sound churning away into the violent city. The spectators dispersed quickly, clumsily, back to their journeys, ashamed of their bloody appetite. And Leah felt the edges of the place cool and settle, her mind collecting up all that had briefly unravelled as the traffic lights went from chlorine to fluorine to bright bromine red, as the world shifted down three octaves too late. By the time she'd got to the other side of the road, she had landed on Yeats. The poet was Yeats. She still couldn't remember the philosopher. Her eyes remained locked to the pavement until she reached the hospital. The doctor said it was bad news. It was back. She couldn't hear the rest. The room had emptied of all sound. There was only the chilling giggle of the girl who hadn't died. So faint it was barely audible at first, but as it grew clearer and closer, the voice was joined by other voices, those of London's lucky inhabitants who had all narrowly missed their endings. And like wave strengthening upon wave, their lament, lament bounced between the brick and the glass of the city before rushing in at last through the crack in the hospital window, filling up every inch of the room. It was you, Leah, not us, you. Wow. Maggie, <laughs> are you reading more for us? I could just listen to you keep reading. I can, I can read it. I can read a little bit more. I can read, I can read, um, uh, I could read a little bit from the ending. This voice, this book has so many voices and, um, you're going to spoil the ending for us. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no, there's no spoilers that she's dying. <laughs> Not that everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there's no yes, spoilers that she's dying reading for us i love that um should i yeah okay great 
Um, I'm going to read uh, from near the end of the book. Um, and yeah, it's like I said, there's no spoilers that, um, that Leah, the character you've just met is um, dying. Um, and the book is really a portrait of her life as she nears death, um, a portrait of her loves and her triumphs and her secrets and failures. Um, and there are various perspectives. We shift between the third and the first person. Um, we move between the landscape of her body and outside. Um, and um, all of these voices come together in a union by the, um, by the end of the book. And I'm gonna read from near the ending where she is in her last days. Forgiveness does not happen with the flick of a switch. There is residue everywhere. Fragments, visitors, fingers, the light but lasting voices of old friends, kind strangers, dresses and devils and sharp edges of memory. I feel them all make their final slow exits out of me. Settle quietly around the room. Perching on the edge of photo frames, they tap their weary eyes. We tried, they hum, simple, tuneful. We tried. A life has its palette, its key. The house is back to its usual self and Harry tidies quietly around the bed. He switches the vacuum onto its lowest setting. There is only this vanishing gray noise and I am briefly pleased we went for the slightly more expensive model five or six years ago or thereabouts. Robust and durable, requires little to no maintenance, the packaging said. When he is done, he comes over and kisses my forehead. I do not feel set alight by his lips. I feel relieved by them. This, I am sure, is better. Hello you, he says. He is no longer beastly, but there is still a little of the earth under his fingernails. Flexible, rechargeable, cordless. Connie has come. She smells how I always hoped I would smell at our age. Equivocal friend, expensive, warm, efficient, much life to go. She says Iris will be back soon. Apparently I've been calling for her. Hospital bed arrives. Top to toe, they slide me onto it and I make a joke about a soldier that nobody hears. Our bed disappears. I do not know where to. I'm finding this a lot. Things are swapped, arranged, repositioned. My few possessions seem to have improved themselves. I make a joke about a fat queen. Nobody hears. Water. In the bath, I feel like a Martian mudstone being examined by scientists. Body expansive, not mine. They can now prove there was a lake, a lake on Mars. Lake of water, not quite water. They know about the nature of the lake, its rhythms, shape, depth, and pattern by studying the minerals in these mudstones, magnetites, hematites, the other tites. I remember reading about the scientists submerging these stones in chemicals, waiting for the crucial reaction that would reveal some new and ancient truth about the cosmos. The whole operation cost about $2.5 billion. I remember Harry slamming the newspaper down and saying, America, in that voice reserved only for one word statements. I want to tell them this. I want to share the small connections my mind can still make. I want to remind them that I am still here, that this body they see now says nothing of my nature, nothing of my life's rhythm. I look at Harry, open my mouth, remember? His eyebrows lift, ready to receive what it is I want to say. But the whole thing suddenly feels unclear, convoluted. And I am not sure what it is that I hope to mean by it. Connie takes the shower head, cups my skull with her velvet hand. Hot water in hair, first soak, nothing like it. Such simple luxury. They begin to knead away at me, up my thighs, my sides, my arms, my chest. They drain me of my waist. How is it, she adds, how is it that you manage to look so beautiful still? Doesn't she? She looks at Harry, pushing his thumbs up a ridge of shin. Yes, he means it. Radiant. They are both trying not to cry. Liars. I am smiling, I think spoilt, undeserving child smile. 
I've forgotten all about the mudstones. Is that a, <laughs> a reasonable place to start? <laughs> There's such a music to your writing. Do you have a background in poetry? Yes, it, yes. Well, poetry was kind of my first love. Um, and it, I kind of feel that prose and poetry should, are sort of indivisible in, in many ways and, and, and should be at least. Um, and yeah, so, so I, I, the kind of the rhythms of the text and the way that a sentence kind of falls and its inherent musicality is like, is a kind of essential and incredibly important to me. And I am very annoying when I write because I speak, I kind of speak aloud as I write. So if I'm in a library and I'm, um, I'm always, I'm always, yeah, whispering or, or I'm trying to kind of chart those like cadences and the rhythms. Um, so yes, poetry. And I kind of had, po I have, I've always had poetry books open um, on my desk when I, as I write. So, so yeah, the, 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 the kind of the poetic influence is very strong. I wonder because I'm, I'm listening to you read that it was so apparent to me that I thought like this is a book where have you been asked to narrate an audiobook of your own book no no I haven't but I maybe should have been <laughs> I think you should have been. I should have been we got the the people that run the the people that did the audiobook that there's a, a, a brilliant actress called Tamsin Grieg um over in the UK she's quite a big actress um and she doesn't usually do audiobooks and so um, it was like amazing that she came and did um, the first person voice um, the, the, and uh, this lovely actress called Lydia Wilson, who's also supremely talented, did the third person. Because if you can see, it's hard when you're reading, but um, parts of the book um, are um, told in bold and parts of them are in kind of normal font and the book plays with fonts a lot um, and different types. And so it was a really exciting kind of polyphonic experience hearing the audio book come to life um, because yeah, because of all of that play on the page and all of those different voices sort of competing to tell the story. And that's fascinating too. So it, it has the audio, audio component of the lyricism of poetry that to me, I thought like, well, this is a book that's meant to be heard like poetry. Yeah. But then as you presented the pages to us just now, there's an aesthetic, just like written poetry will often play with the meter and the typeface. What was it like from your editor and publisher's perspective of you writing a novel that presented visually so differently? Did you get any pushback on that? Yeah, so I get this question. No, well, I didn't. I get this question a lot. People are like, what did you have to do to convince someone to be like, fine, 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 we'll have you. Um, but, uh, but I think that um, I really believe that um, I, I, well, I had no, I had no pushback. And if anything, I was given the freedom to, to experiment more. Um, and I think that in part, that was really um about a, a few books that had come out before um, this one that had really like paved the way and made it possible for people to be quite excited about text formatting and mm -hmm. like Max Porter's Lanny. Max Porter is um, very big over here. I don't know whether he's as big over in the US, but his um, Lanny was a beautiful book that a lot of it was, you know, kind of bestseller over here and had lots of interesting kind of typesetting and um, kind of swirling words and um, yeah, kind of text that didn't, that felt that, you know, that didn't fall in the kind of traditional line um, that you'd expect. And um, so, so there was, yeah, I think, I think that it's kind of, I owe it. Um, I owe a lot of the acceptance of the publishing world um, and, you know, editors and stuff to, um, to a few kind of genre bending experimental books that came before me and, and yeah, and like lit the way and, and kind of kicked open the doors and all of the metaphors that you could choose. <laughs> That's beautiful. Oh, I love that. Um... And the fact that you weren't met with pushback too is really remarkable that they just trusted you. Yeah, I mean, you can see here that like there is, 
um oh wow like it it's there there's there's so many bonkers pages Uh, and Thank you for showing us just the visual being so much a part of the book it's yeah, like we, we why, why not us. yeah why not this um, is the privilege you at home are all getting tonight because if you were just sitting in a, an impact audience in our little store would you be able to see the book no, no. you'd have to buy it you'd have to buy it because you all <laughs> just have to buy it yeah I don't like can't give away all the graphics yes <laughs> yes um but um but yeah and there's but there's beauty and I and I would work I would I would work on them like kind of little incantations and stuff um they don't they take up their they're not they don't kind of consume the book but they're definitely sort of like sprinkled through and and really and are kind of there when they serve the story mm-hmm. and also a kind of massively part Leah my protagonist is an illustrator and so I kind of always felt that um that the 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 way that the text was laid out on the page felt integral to kind of her the way that the visual way that she saw the world um and it it kind of arrived immediately there was no kind of playing um or thinking or maybe you know the words should spiral here it felt very much that the way that she saw the world was incredibly yeah incredibly visual and and kind of um mad and um and yeah, so it kind of felt like it's it's embedded in the way that she sees the world and her character being this, yeah, being this visual person. Um, but I didn't, I I actually had, I actually by the end realized how receptive um, the pub, my publishers were that I felt that I could, I was saying things like, can we, I can't personally turn this phrase into a firework, but can you? <laughs> and they'd be like, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, so, you know, contemporary publishing, modern publishing is a phenomenal thing. <laughs> yeah. So when you were writing yourself before saying like, I can't turn it into fire, can you, how did that show up for you in your process? Like you said, it was a natural part for Leah, the illustrator for it to come from her, but from you, are you an illustrator are you a visual person so (laughs) so where did that come from for you in your process so I um I well a few things so I I, I'm a big fan of um Mark Z Danielewski Danielewski have I pronounced that right um he so so I've I've been you know kind of aware of of um books that really play with form like that um and kind of art object books um like Anne Carson's Knox which um was a huge inspiration for the book um but uh, and so I so I always knew that I was going to try and attempt it and that I have InDesign I just bought InDesign and I thought I'm just gonna draw um pathways uh which is like a tool that you can do in InDesign and um just draw kind of birds or circles or uh or or the kind of the rhythm the musical rhythms of a of a sentence and you can draw a path and then you type along the path and so I would I just sort of taught myself to do that not um as I was writing as a kind of thing on the side and then thank god um could give it to, um could give my slightly scrappy kind of you know um unhinged version and um the publishers make it all very sleek and um a little bit less ha- you know amateur um but yeah so 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 they they and they, yeah it was I was I was really surprised by how um by yeah how how open they were to it and also by how quickly I picked up the InDesign type along a path feature <laughs> I love the examples of Anne Carson and Mark Z. Danielewski. Uh, also, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. So I was like, yeah, that's how you say it. And I'm like, I actually don't know. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Um, because those are two great examples of lyrical, poetic novelists who play both with typeface, but the genre, I mean, that that is something that I often as a bookseller will tell people of if you are afraid of poetry here's autobiography of red which reads both like a novel and like a poem you know mm-hmm. um 
I've read only Revolutions by uh, Daniel Whiskey, which reads forwards and backwards. And so the visual component is just as much of an interest as the word play. Uh, mm. I think the novelty really strikes people um, in genre bending. Uh, would you refer to your own book as genre bending? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 the book is very sort of aware that it's a book and it really, it's it's as a kind of, as a tech, I'm really interested in, in um, the way that form and story, um, you know, are in constant communication with one another and the way that they can deceive each other and and um and and yeah and 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 boost each other um and kind of play little tricks on each other so I'm very my book is sort of about bodies and I'm very interested in textual bodies and like how physical a thing a book can be and how to create a how to kind of create a journey through a woman's body because that's what it is it's a journey through a woman's life and her body as she as she's dying and so to feel that you're being led through this kind of this physical textual body and making those connections between um paper and skin and wounds and words um and um felt yeah felt kind of immediately like something that I knew I was doing by about halfway through <laughs> I was like yes this this does seem to make sense this <laughs> this can you know the, the conceit behind it all I guess of it being um a, a real physical journey I guess um and the and the kind of yeah because it's in many ways sort of a novel about novels a novel about making art mm. um uh she because Leah's Leah, I mean she's a creative she's a children's book illustrator she's writing a book um a kind of uh, a kind of language book throughout um, which appears in little snippets. It's called a children's pocket guide to lexical spectacles. And it's about the rewriting of word definitions. Um, and that just, and that kind of is punctuates the novel in kind of a small way. Um, but she, you know, the, this, this first person voice that leads us through her body is kind of very much the worst of her. And it's all about her coming to terms with the I, with the first person, with the fact that she is a self in a body. She's this, you know, that the, she's this kind of, um, you know, we, we all are these kind of, yeah, these, these eyes, these, these selves moving through these kind of strange, um, strange yeah strange bodies and 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 how we come to terms with um embodied experience and and the kind of mind body divide and everything is is very much at the kind of the dual the duality um at the center of the book um so yeah so it's a book about form really and about the way we tell our stories and and which versions of ourselves we let take the lead and learning to forgive the fact that we are um you know a person really yeah why did you make the choice i'm so curious uh that you allow the disease a voice um, um we'll that yeah. obviously is an unconventional choice and we're talking so much about form here um did that come first uh before the form because you said the form eventually like halfway through you were like yes this is right so mm -hmm. I wonder which pieces in your writing process, was it the character, Leah, and her journey? Was it, I want a disease to tell a story first? Which pieces came when? Yeah, so the the whole kind of, the genesis of the whole thing was very much, I, it's kind of loosely based on, you know, amidst all the form playing and the, the, the genre bending and the poetry, um, the, it's kind of loosely based off the last six months of my mum's life. She died when I was 14. And so the book is really in the same way that Knox is an elegy to Anne Carson's brother. It's This is really an elegy to my mum. And I was looking back a lot on the last six months of her life. And, and that time, which was a very weird, intense time uh, for a 14 year old as well, where you're kind of a bit like, you just want to get on with your life. And you're like, God, my, my mum's just got in the way <laughs> of, of me becoming a, you know, of becoming an adult. And I think that in many ways I didn't process um I didn't process her death because I was so preoccupied with being a grown-up teenager person um and so just kept returning to that time and found myself you know have always written and found myself writing and writing and it just kept coming I kept going back to those last six months and it just and so 
so I knew that I wanted to tell the story of the last six months of a woman's life. Um, uh, but I also, because I, because of the fiction that I love, um, and because of the poetry that I love, I knew that it couldn't just be a kind of linear story that didn't play with form. And so I began to write these little scraps of prose poems that took place within the shifting landscape of a woman's body and mm -hmm. thought, why don't I put that in, you know, have the inside and the outside, you know, moving constantly until the, all the boundaries begin to dissolve. Cause that's what happens when you're very ill. Like all of the boundaries of past, present, inside, outside, everything kind of falls into one mess. Um, and so, so, so yeah, so I was, I was playing with these little prose poems of these, four, of these kind of characters moving about this landscape and having healing or destructing effects on the landscape itself. So it had this almost eco-critical quality to the whole thing. Um, and, um, uh, but it was just so, it was so abstract. And I knew that we sort of needed a guide through that. Um, because it was playing out kind of like a traditional quest narrative, like, you know, mm. what is an ill landscape? What is a deteriorating landscape? And and um, and so it was, yeah, it was very much this kind of quest narrative of these characters who were her dear, her, her loved ones, her daughter, her husband, her first love, all moving through her body. But I just, it felt like it was it was, you know, having it next to the, the third person, her life story felt like it was just, it was too similar and also too abstract. Um, and so I was like, no, we need a guide. We need an eye. And I've always been really fearful of the first person because it seems like a kind of sight of certainty in some way, or at least I, I feel like I couldn't hide from the first person myself. Um, and so I was really fearful of it and then realized that actually the eye what had to be had to be the illness itself it had to be the thing that was destroying her slowly or at least um because i don't it's never actually named throughout the book it's never actually um pinpointed as her the um, disease you mean as the disease yes it's never it's never named it's um so it's it's sort of implied throughout that it's her illness but it's many things it's a kind of shape-shifting voice um so mm -hmm. it's her in many ways it's her kind of creative processing of her own illness it's not a kind of um universal cancer voice which I think would feel very uncomfortable personifying something that you know it's it's entirely independent um it's entirely um, hers, it's entirely composed of her. And that's what I guess cancer cells are. They're not foreign bodies that come in, they're mutations of our own cells. They're kind of scrappy, hyperactive versions of our own cells. And so the I came from me thinking about what the worst of a person could sound like. Um, but of course, like the, the destructive core of all of us is also our kind of creative essence. Um, and so, so it, but it kind of, it grew from there. Um, and, and yeah, and the voice, the voice is really, it is her. And that's the kind of, you know, that's the, the revelation, I guess, um, as you, as you read the book is that, that she's reckoning with herself um, just as much as she is with the illness that's killing her. So you refer to the first person, the disease as the, uh darker self maybe the ugly parts of ourself um is that something that made it easier for you or more uh of an accessible entry point for you in writing first person because you said you were scared of it so i imagine that took a lot of courage to be like i'm gonna do this thing i'm afraid of in my book mm. yeah yeah i think i think that yes perhaps yeah. i think i um yeah, I think it was incredibly freeing being like this voice can just be, this voice has no rules because it's a non-human narrator. Mm -hmm. There isn't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Is there such thing? Um, it's a, there's a, um, it's a, there's a non, it's a non-human narrator. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it has no form really. It mm -hmm. kind of, it works. It, it, it kind of materializes much sort of like the Freudian id or Jung's shadow. It's, it's, it, it you're kind of, fooled into thinking that it is her cancer um but emerges much like um more, much like young yeah young shadow or freud's id it's it's the kind of and it gets into her 
um, brain and knows everything and can and toy and can toy with it with any with any of her memories and um, and her thoughts. And so it was very freeing to just have something that was so um, gleeful in its ability to destroy, to just kind of wreak havoc in its surroundings. Um, and I took a lot of the thing, the book that I returned to a lot was Eloise, this, the child's, um, mm -hmm. you know, Kay Thompson's Eloise. Yeah. Um, because the voice. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> of all the other references you've made. It was yeah. a surprise, yes. Um, so I, it was like one of the first books my mum ever read aloud to me. And um, I just adored her because she was so naughty and she just, <laughs> was such a nightmare and so <laughs> had such such belief in her she has such she had such kind of belief in her um naughtiness and such and kind of fantasized and um and had had such um confidence in the way that she played and I think that we sort of forget how to play as adults and I wanted the voice to kind of be like wrecking havoc around a hotel like the body being a hotel and Eloise being the voice oh, um, wow. And so that's that's sort of that's the central conceit really of the book is this voice that's moving through the hotel of a body, mm. a hotel body, and you know like keying down corridors and and terrorizing its guests, all of its kind of passing, um, yeah, its guests passing through, and I, I liked this. I, I was thinking about this. I liked this idea of 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 the self, the consciousness, like our you know our 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 brains feeling like um little kind of like these child versions of ourselves these little kind of you know instinctive very hyperactive and imaginative children and that that's what our experience of consciousness is and we just pass through our bodies this idea that we we're, we're temporary guests and we wreck havoc and then we leave um and she yeah she was such fun so she was a way of like grounding me Eloise would like sit on my desk every day whilst reading the book oh. and I'd like have fun if you're not having fun what's the point you know what an incredible metaphor my god and <laughs> so unexpected just like in a kid's book and then it, it sounds just really haunting when you paint that picture of we're, we're guests in our own bodies in a, in a hotel uh, I do want to take a moment to read aloud um, one of our attendees tonight left a comment in the Q&A module for you. Ben says, thank you. The book is brilliant. You have beautiful graphic elements in the book. Could you talk about the ideas behind this and where they come from and how and why you chose to do this? We've covered some of that. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder what the writing process was like for you of um, like a start to finish. If it was a linear writing process for you. Um, if you were writing during COVID, it being your first novel, if you knew it was going to be a novel. And so taking Ben's comment there, just talking about what it was like for you writing your first book. Yeah, um, uh, it was, it was relative. No, I think I'm, I'm a very, I think I'm a very restless, my writing style is very restless and quite sporadic and so and because it's quite structurally quite complex as a book there was a lot of planning involved in a way that kind of felt early on a bit weird because it was like that it's you know it's a literary novel um but it was almost like I was planning it like it was almost like I was like world building like it was a fantasy novel um I was like because it just had so many components and yeah. this this landscape and these voices and so there was lots of world building um and um and kind of physical physical drawings of maps and stuff that I just got very bogged down in early on and lots of kind of because it's fragmented too so lots of writing fragments from later on and then piecing them together but I think because there are lots of threads there is the kind of the past of Leah's life the present and the inside of her body I wrote her present in a very linear way and stitched together um the stories of her inside and her past 
and kind of wove yeah and 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 so it was it was a very there was lots of rigorous planning and there were moments where because there are things that are happening on the outside that have to reflect things that are going on on the inside of her body um, that are also in communication with events that happened in her past. So there was like moments where my brain was just exploding and I was just like, I don't, I don't think I feel qualified for this. I don't know what this is or how I got here, but there's so many components. Um, so, so yeah, so it was, it was a bit of a, yeah. It was there were my there were some mind exercises going on, but um, but I generally wrote it in a very um, yeah, the present was and I it all and I was writing the ending, I was in, finishing it over lockdown for kind of the depths of lockdown was as I was coming to the ending, um, and it was like strangely, um, uh, I felt very lucky because of um, just the intensity of COVID, not having any distractions it's kind of I mean obviously it was a horrendous situation and no one was like having fun um but but for an author focusing or for someone who wanted to be an author who's writing their first book you know to 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 remove all distractions and to just sit with this thing that you've been you know you've been running up to that I think to that that the final um I don't know the final quarter of the novel to to have to to be able to just um, write it in that focused way was kind of a blissful gift and and that was I was writing kind of the death of um, the main character and um, and and by the you know the book is 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 fiction uh, but by the end those kind of final like 30 pages or so are pretty um, pretty autobiographical they're pretty exactly what happened the way that uh, um, I lost my mum and the events uh, that kind of led to her yeah her final days are pretty um, a pretty you know true um, I guess is the best way of putting it um, and so that was a fear, you know, intensely emotional and just sort of wrote it and, and had moved back home and was writing in the place that I grew up and was just um, sort of living it all again and seeing it for the first time and being able to put into words something that I never thought I would. Um, and so it was so it was so emotional and just cried while I was writing it and just got it all out and then finished it and went downstairs and read it to my sister and my dad and we all cried and not a comma has, has changed really of that ending. Um, since the since writing it so um well so much has been edited obviously but the last but that la those last few pages pretty much nothing's been touched and and that's that's a gift as a writer to to know that you've just that it's there and it's untouchable and and you'll probably I don't think I'll write anything like it again because of where it came from and and the intensity of it um so <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so, you're talking about something so deeply personal and the intensity of that. I'm so, so Um yeah, no, that was that was that yeah, that's yeah, that's it really. That was my yeah, that was the experience of it of it all, and that was the ending. Um and the way that it, yeah, the way that it all came together. Um so yeah, it was it was it was a very intense. COVID made everything intense, obviously, um, but but kind of it it felt yeah it felt like the conditions were actually incredibly um, yeah incredibly like helpful and um, and yeah it was it was a, it was an amazing experience and I will yeah I'll never have a writing writing experience like it again and really mourn. Um, that time actually in some ways and and had to sort of lose another lose a character because your characters become like you're you know more real than the people in your life anyway so it was kind of mourning um, or grieving kind of my mum's death and then at the same time Leah's because she became her own person um, and being like why do we do this to ourselves <laughs> um, but but hugely I just learned I just learned a lot and it's just my favorite thing to do ever and just felt so happy that it was out there and I could put it onto the page and so everything else from that point was just a luxury 
That sounds so incredibly cathartic. And thank you so much for not just sharing that with us here tonight, but for you to be so giving to offer something so deeply personal in your work. And now it's out there, it's on shelves. It's something physical and real that can live in someone's home. Uh, so thank you, that is, that is such a gift that you've given people to allow people in like that. I want to allow folks, if anyone here tonight has any questions for Maddie, we have a few more minutes before we need to wrap up. Uh, you can use the chat or the Q&A, whatever works for you, if you'd like to get a question or comment in. And of course, a final reminder, I have the buy link in the chat if anyone's in the US. Uh, so we ship anywhere in the US, you can use our website and the coupon code green light events 10 for 10% 10 off. We have copies at both of our locations. Thank you so much, Maddie. No, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm going to be, I'm, I've been coming to New York at the end of July, early August for like a month now. So oh, I'll great. definitely pop into green light. And then you can sign your books. Exactly. Amazing. And uh, so I wanted to ask, this might be like a silly last question to, to end on, but I just think the the cover is so beautiful because um, it seems it's a, it's a current trend in book marketing and jacket design, the more like abstract color. And so it could appear at first, at least in the US jacket design, that it's just this kind of collage of color but then if you look more closely, you can see the body in its pieces and parts. Uh, I don't know what the UK cover looks like if it's the copy you have, uh, that you can show us if they're the same yeah. jacket design. So, yeah. so this, is the U, this is the US and it's got these like really beautiful deckled edges and everything. Um, I loved the US cover the most when it first came in um, and was so delighted and, no complaints just beautiful I liked that it's um that it's almost like there's some slightly harlequin-y about it as well and because the kind of the the narrator in the book is sort of like a trickster um, mm. um, it felt uh it was kind of both fun but also really elegant and yeah and the U, uh, U, UK cover is a bit more bonkers it's like a it's oh, a wow that almost looks like a psych textbook or something yeah, it's bonkers. Like, it's got like, philosophy. Novel. I don't think I'd pick it up and be like, that's a novel. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's bold, isn't it? It's so and bold. Then, yeah, the sort of like, it looks like a fingerprint, the, the like yeah. spotty kind of textured component. Yeah. Wow. The, it's a very, the, the covers in America and England are very, very, very different. different. Um, yeah. But it's, but it's, yeah, but it is beautiful. And I love the blue, the kind of Eve's Klein blue. Mm. Um, is mad um and yeah I yeah I just I was I just got the Norwegian cover I just thought maybe but I, I can't find it now um but the Norwegian's just covering and that's also bonkers it's just very funny seeing oh, wow. all the do you get a say in any of these can I what do you get a say like do you get to be like no I, that doesn't represent my book or like yes this not this yeah 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 a little bit I mean you can't um, I had, yeah, you, you have, I think like some sort of like veto power, but I do feel like you need to, you do need to sort of just like let the, the pub publishers and the art departments do their thing, I think. But yeah, I mean, there's been some mad covers that have been sent to me from various territories, um, around the world and been like, this is your cover and been like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> just the weirdest thing um but yeah fascinating oh thank you so much Matt, thank you everyone for attending tonight and uh go buy maddie's book congratulations yeah. Yeah, thank you so much you said your book has been out in the uk for a month now so maybe it doesn't feel like nearly the party as it is for us to see your book laying on the shelf yesterday um but thank you all for attending so much and thank you Maddie. Thank you. See ya.
Good sleep. Bye.